Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome, whether you're here online or in person, we really like having you here today. Uh, kind of a quiet morning instead of our normal music that we played and everything that we had in our, our feed in as we come into the service, but uh, still a great day. We had a fantastic movie last night, uh, really spoke to me again. I, I've seen it like four times now, and every time I see that movie, it really just, you know, uh, charges me up, gets me going, gets the blood pumping, and makes me really, really want to reach out for Christ. So uh, if you haven't had a chance to see the movie, uh, Do You Believe? Uh, we start our four-part sermon series this week. If you need to see the movie, I'll be more than happy to lend the movie out to you so you can take it home and watch it. Um, and it's worth seeing again and again because every time I see it, it kind of reveals something else to me that I missed when I've seen it before. And it's, uh, it's an awesome experience. And it really kind of opens up a lot of pathways to what everybody goes through on a regular basis around us. And it kind of gives us that peak of community that, you know, even though we ourselves are facing things, there's other people out there that are facing things as well. And, and the neat thing that I take away from that is, and from the movie is, God is at work in every one of those situations simultaneously. At the same time, he's doing works. And if you noticed, and I don't want to spoil it for those of you who haven't seen it, but uh, as it goes through the movie, it kind of intertwines things together a little bit. And you see how the inner workings of one person can touch the life of another. And at the same time as they're ministering to one person, they're being ministered to at the same time. And that's one of the great things about God, is he is always at work in every situation. Even though the situation might seem dire, it might seem terrible, God is at work in all of it. And that's a great thing to start the day with off today. So let's, let's open our uh, time of worship and prayer this morning. Gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, we just come before you today and we praise you and thank you for this opportunity to gather together today in your name and to bring forth your word today and we just ask today that you would open our eyes to see the blessings and the miracles around us to have our ears hear your message and receive it into our hearts today so that we can live it out day by day and lord as we go through our lives in here we know that we are going to face many challenges many trials and many tests that you have for us out here Lord, we just want to make sure that we keep our minds open to the fact that you are there with us in the midst of these storms, in the midst of the challenges, in the midst of the trials. You are there and you are doing a work in us and through us, not just for ourselves, but for others. And Lord, we just praise you and thank you for those works that you do in us each and every day. In your precious and holy name, we pray. Amen. So this, uh, this morning's message is based on the movie from last night do you believe and when i uh, started doing the message and writing the the sermon out for this i actually started a couple of weeks ago and even if i think about it i go back even further back to october when i was trying to plan out what we were going to be seeing for movies coming up in the next few months and uh you know i i came across some some things in there and i said well i think this really speaks to me and as I watched it a couple more times so that I could really prepare a, a good message around it, um, I saw a dichotomy that was there in that message or in that question, do you believe? And so as we start off this morning, our call to worship comes from Matthew 7, 24 through 27. It says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house upon the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew against that house, yet it did not fall, because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell with a mighty crash. And so if you think back to when you were in Sunday school as a kid, you know, you, you heard this one, it's, it's really common for us to hear. 
But really, when I was doing this message today, it took on a whole new meaning, and, and uh, God pretty, pretty much revealed some other things about this. And so I'm, I'm going to kind of return to this a little later on and give you some insights on this. But the question here is, do you believe? And when you look at this, it can be either a question or a statement. Do you believe? Or do you believe? Now, one could be a probing question of self-reflection where we take a look and it might invoke kind of, you know, some, some thoughts of doubt. Some doubt. Do you believe? And if so, what do you believe? So it's kind of a double-edged sword when we take a look at it. And also at the same time, it asks, it asks a question, it makes a statement. As we saw in the movie last night, it might ask, do you believe? And it's important to note at this point in time, what have you done about it? If you claim to be a believer and you claim to follow Christ, he calls us to go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. Do you believe? What have you done about it? What are you doing currently to put your faith into action? So it's kind of neat to take a look at this and look at two sides of that same statement. Now, as we do, it's important to note that there's a difference between doubt and unbelief. And I kind of want to cover some of the things, but primarily doubt leads to questioning and that usually leads to doing some kind of research. And in this case, it's probably going to get you back into the Word of God to get answers that you are looking for. So from that point, doubt can be a very good thing. It makes us think and learn the scriptures, what they say, what they mean. And as we study God's Word, as the scriptures say, He reveals the truth to us. As we have that relationship with God, he reveals more and more of his word to us, more and more of the truth. And like I say, when I'm preparing these sermons, boy, I get these insights that pop in. Even though I've read this passage in the Bible many times before, I've heard it before, but when God reveals it to you and says, hey, now I'm going to open your mind a little bit more, and I want you to understand these things too. And it's really, really important to understand that it's not a bad thing to have doubts. As a matter of fact, according to the study, 46% of Christians have doubts. But it's what you do with those doubts. See, if, if you have doubts and you go into study and you try and get answers, you go to someone else and get their opinion on it, and you, you kind of start to reveal what might actually be at the base of this thing. Well, that's a good thing. It, as we study and as we grow, as we learn, it makes us grow as a Christian and it strengthens our relationship with God. But see, unbelief is those people who don't want to have anything to do with God. They've fallen away. If, if doubt is left to linger, it can expand within us. And then we start to kind of go, well, if we don't learn about what it is that we're questioning, <coughs> We won't get the answers. And if we don't have answers after a while, then we start to follow down that path of unbelief. And so it's really, really uh, a point of frustration in not getting the answers that we are looking for. You shut down and give up, and that leads to falling away, which is not a good thing. And sometimes it takes a jolt to set you back on the track, so to speak, and get you headed back in the right direction. Unbelief is often a result of an outside influence or a circumstance that leads us to that position of unbelief. And when we were talking about this earlier on this year and the foundations of our faith, and, <coughs> excuse me, and we were talking about how atheists are out there and, and they, they just kind of got this, my mind's all made up, don't confuse me with facts. Don't try and change my mind. And so they blocked everything out and they, they are the true epitome of what is termed unbelief. Is because they don't want to have that position of God. They don't want to have anyone have that position of God. 
So as we watch that movie, A Case for Faith, A Case for Christ, you know, we heard all about that. And he was, he was dead set as there is no God, period, none whatsoever. Don't confuse me with facts. My mind's made up. And then as he went from that unbelief, that position that God does not exist, as he found out more and more and did the research, guess what? No more doubt, no more unbelief. And since Lee Strobel took that position and did the research and found out that the facts were the facts, and he proved them out, he no longer has unbelief. And that's what I'm talking about here. So doubt is not a bad thing. It takes us into that research. It gets us back into the word of God. It gets us out of that position where we're at, where we're questioning so much, and gets us the answers that we're looking for. They're right here. We just got to look them up, dust them off. So no one is immune from doubt. It can happen to all of us. And you just got to know how to handle it then when it comes along. Even the greatest men and women of God in the Bible had to deal with doubt. Uh, John the Baptist and the Apostle Thomas are just two examples that I'm going to use today. And we need to understand that there's lots more in there. And if we take a look back to Abraham and Isaac and David, there was doubt among all of them. Job is another one. There's lots of examples in the Bible, so it's not something that God wants us to shy away from. He brings it right out in the scriptures. He tells us about the doubt, but he also tells us in there what they did about the doubt and how they dispelled it and how they came back into that relationship with God. Now, we need to understand that all those people I just talked about, they were anointed by God to do special works. So if you and I are just sitting out here and, and we have doubt and we're kind of going, oh man, it's, I'm just not good enough. Look at these people here. These people were anointed by God. They were doing special work for God and yet they still had doubt. So doubt's not bad for you and I. It helps us dig further and get closer to God and get closer to the answers God has for us. Jesus said of John the Baptist in Matthew 11, 11, I tell you the truth of all who have ever lived, none is greater than John the Baptist. Yet even the least person in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. So when we take a look at this, John the Baptist, no person ever fulfilled God's given purpose better than John the Baptist. No one. Yet in God's coming kingdom, all members will have a greater spiritual heritage than John because they will have seen and known Christ and his finished work on the cross. See, John never had that opportunity. He died before he saw Jesus finish his work on the cross. This means that John was greater in the sight of Jesus than Abraham and Joseph and Moses and David or any other Old Testament character that you can name. Yet, John doubted the most important thing of all by questioning whether Jesus really was the Savior, the Messiah. John the Baptist had been cast into prison for criticizing Herod about marrying his brother's wife, an adulterous and insidious, incestuous relationship. There had been some time, about six months to two years, that he had been imprisoned in there. And he became discouraged, so discouraged. And doubt crept in and said, why would God leave me here in prison all this time after doing his work? I lived my life out doing the work of God. And here I sit in this prison by myself. How can a loving God do that to me? And so he began to doubt, and he, he started really, really taking this doubt on to himself, and he had nothing to do in this point in time. He had no Bible to open up. He had nothing to fall back on. And so he, he talked to two of his followers. We call them disciples, and, and he asked them, 
to go back and see if Jesus was really the Christ. And it's really easy to read that and think there's you know, not much to it, but the truth is it was nothing more than unbelief on the part of John the Baptist. Think about who John was. He was set apart by God and filled with the Holy Spirit from the womb. From the womb. Jesus wasn't even filled with the Holy Spirit in the womb. It is believed that he lived in the desert near the Dead Sea with the Essenes. And the Essenes were the group of people who were super legalistic and they were very dogmatic in their actions. They practiced many rituals of self-denial. And he certainly did not live what would have been called an easy life. He lived on a diet of locusts and wild honey. And yet John was sat, separated and focused on his purpose. God put it in the spirit from before he was born, while he was still in the womb. God sent his spirit to John. And he had a lifelong purpose that God had set him up for to fulfill. His entire life was committed to preparing the way for Christ. He spent 30 years preparing for a ministry that would only last six short months. John is the one who saw Jesus and said, Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world. In John 1, 29. If you want to pop the next slide up, they can see the scripture references in case you want to look them up. I've got a few today you can see. The anointing on his life had to be exceptionally powerful because his ministry defied logic. Thousands of people from many nations came to the middle of nowhere to hear the man preach. People were drawn to him in the middle of the desert where he was to hear him preach. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And God had revealed to him through that visible sign from heaven that he would know who Christ was. He would see the Spirit of God descending upon the Messiah in bodily shape as a dove. And that came to pass when John the Baptist baptized Jesus in the Jordan River. See, at that time, John was absolutely certain that Jesus was the Christ. He had zero doubt. He was adamant and so adamant about the fact that he said, I saw and bear record to this is the Son of God. In John 1, 3, 34. In Luke 3, 16, he said, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I will come, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. See, however convinced he was and how sure he was of who Christ was, he laid witness to it. He preached it to thousands and thousands of people. However, after being imprisoned for such a long time, his humanism crept in and he began to doubt. See, now this reveals several things to us, but most importantly is the fact that anyone can doubt. Yes, even preachers can and do doubt. They can and do doubt. So let's look at how Jesus responded to John's doubt. So the first thing is, is if, if you had someone who is casting doubt upon you, what is the first thing you want to do? Well, you want to defend yourself. You want to get critical of that other person and what they're doing and what they're saying. But did Jesus rebuke him? Did he cast him out? Did he downplay him? Did he cast him down? No. Jesus told John's disciples to go back and tell him of the miracles they had witnessed and that John would be blessed if he would just believe. That's it. That's it. Go back and remind John of the miracles that they had seen and that if he believed, he would be blessed by it. Jesus didn't try and make John feel better by letting him know he understood his pain 
by making a few complimentary compliments, like we kind of do today. They're there, everything's going to be okay. Now he understood his pain. He understood the doubt that was in John. And, and so he knew what was going to make John better. Jesus reserved all of those type of comments, the feel-good comments, until after John's disciples left, according to Luke. In Luke 7, 24 through 27, or through 28, it says, after John's messengers left, Jesus began to speak to the crowd again about John. What did you go out in the wilderness to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No. Those who wear expensive clothes and indulge in luxury are in palaces. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written, I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare the way before you. And I tell you, among these born of women, there is no one greater than John, yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. So why didn't Jesus say these things about John the Baptist while John's followers were there? So they could have brought that word back to, back to John in prison. Because it seems like that would have helped John out quite a bit more than just telling him to look at the miracles and if he believes, he will be blessed. But see, that's where the answers come in. If we look into God's word, it gives us the answer. Isaiah 35 says, where the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall come the lame man to leap as a heart and the tongue of the dumb to sing. For in the wilderness shall waters break out and in the streams in the desert. So to us that might be unclear. But it becomes clear that this is exactly the answer that John had for the messengers. That Jesus gave his messengers to take back them. He knew that John knew the scriptures. Look at what Jesus said in Matthew 11, 4 and 6. He says, Go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight. The lame walk. Those who have leprosy are cleansed. And the deaf will hear. The dead are raised. And the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. So he was reminding John of the prophecy that was written 600 years before Jesus appeared. So John would have understood this message that Jesus sent back to him. It wasn't, look at me, it was, the scriptures are, have been revealed and fulfilled through me. And it wasn't just that Jesus performed all the miracles Isaiah pro prophesied that he would do and threw in the healing of the leper and raising some from, from the dead just for good measure. What Jesus did was he perfectly fulfilled the prophecy about himself. And then he referred John the Baptist back to that word. Back to the word. John, Jesus reminded John of the scriptures to deal with his doubts. See, that's Jesus' method for dealing with our doubts today. He wants us to refer back to the Word of God, the truth that is revealed in reading and understanding the Word of God and holding it true to ourselves. And many of us have Bibles laying around gathering dust and someone even carries one once in a while. But when we're struggling with doubt, we don't want a scripture. We want something tangible that we can hang on to, something emotional that we can feel and we always have to look for the answer right in front of us something that we can reach out and touch and believe sound familiar we would rather have jesus just put his arm around us and say something about how everything's just going to be okay give us that pat on the back and that would make us feel better but overcoming doubt isn't just about feeling better it's about getting back into faith. 
and belief that only comes from God's Word. It only comes from the Word of God. Romans 10, 17 says, So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And this is exactly what Jesus did. Jesus sent the Word back to John's disciples. And he knew that that would stir up John's spirit and overcome that doubt. Are we opening up our hearts and our minds to God through the Word of God? Are we looking there first for doubt? Wednesday night in bubble study, we kind of talked about this, that we tend to lean on our own understanding. And we try and have ourselves fix the problem instead of going to God first. See, when we're struggling with all that doubt and, and with all those things, we want something that we can have tangible, that we can reach out and touch. If we could only reach that out and touch, if Jesus could only pat me on the back, then I'd understand and I'd get through this. But see, he's reaching out to us in so many different ways, in so many different forms. Like we saw in the movie last night, so many people intertwined together, having God work through them to work miracles in other people's lives. We have to be open to understand that, to accept that in. These are the tangible things that, that God sends to us. Jesus is giving us the answers to our doubts. To our problems, to our questions. But see, we have to open our minds up. We have to free our minds up to the point where we can listen, understand, receive it into our heart, and then live it out in our lives. Live it out in our lives. Sometimes we're our own worst enemy because we don't do that. We tend to just kind of huddle down, shrink into ourselves. We're trapped in that prison alone. And we'll stay there until we listen for the word of God coming back to us. We'll stay in that prison. So the only sure way to overcome doubt is to place your faith in the word of God and depend on that sure word of prophecy. Don't allow your present circumstance to rule over your faith. Don't allow that present circumstance to overrule your faith. Don't allow your five senses to dominate your thinking. You must come to a place where God's word is more real to you than anything that you can see, hear, taste, smell, or feel. When you're in doubt, refer back to the word of God just as Jesus told John the Baptist to do. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. And I talked about that again on Wednesday night. And I know I was kind of sleep deprived and tired. I just got done driving in 12 hours to get here. And the thing about it is, is these things were being revealed to me. I went back and rewrote part of my sermon this morning because of the things that I got from Wednesday night. God revealed them to me, and we got to share them together. That's what I'm talking about. How we are all intertwined together to help each other, to edify each other, to lift each other up. We need to trust and lean on the Word of God and our faith as a habit, because then it becomes second nature to us, and we don't need to rely on our thinking first. That's a key. We need to rely on the Word of God as a habit. As we look further at this, there's only two times recorded in the Bible when Jesus marveled at anything. Once he marveled at the people's great unbelief in Mark 6.6. 6, when he was in his hometown surrounded by the very people who had known him the longest and still lacked faith. And in Matthew 8.10, he marveled at a, Gal at a Gentile soldier's great faith. A faith that made Jesus marvel is really worth examining. We have to ask ourselves, what is different about it? The number one difference was what the centurion had to say. The centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. 
For I myself am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. And I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. See, the centurion had a faith that was in God's word alone. He didn't have Jesus come to his house, wave his hand over that sick servant and make him well. If Jesus would just give him a word, that's all he needed. A man who only knew Jesus through his deeds and yet had faith. I would call that blind faith. He knew that Jesus could heal the servant sitting in his house without even stepping foot within that house, without waving his hands over it. But simply by the word of God, the servant could be healed. A faith that did not have to be proved out. Jesus marveled at this Gentile and his faith because he didn't know the scriptures. He wasn't educated through the systems. He only knew by word of mouth what Jesus could do. And he had enough faith that his servant would be healed. So contrast this centurion's faith with the little faith of Thomas, who is one of Jesus' disciples. The first time the risen Christ appeared to his disciples, Thomas wasn't present. The other ten disciples told Thomas that Jesus was resurrected. But it was eight more days before Jesus appeared to his disciples with Thomas present. When the disciples later told Thomas that they had seen the resurrected Lord, he replied, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Now this was Thomas, who was one of the most steadfast of the disciples. And we learn from the life of Thomas that he was deeply committed to his master. And yet he struggled with doubt. And he struggled with questions. So John 20, 25 goes on to say, So the other di disciples told him, We have seen the Lord, but he said unto them, Unless I see the nail marks, in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came in and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands? Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting. And believe. Jesus walked up to Thomas and told him to put his finger into the print of the nails and thrust his hand into Jesus' side and not to be faithless, but believing. And Thomas fell on his knees and confessed to Jesus as his Lord and God. John 20, 29 goes on to say, Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. But blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. Jesus placed a greater blessing on those who believe without seeing than those who believe because they have seen. In other words, there's a greater anointing on believing word than in believing signs and wonders. There's a greater blessing on just believing God's word than there is I'm just believing because of supernatural circumstances. If we're all waiting for a miracle to come through and for God to show us a sign before we believe, we're going to die. We're going to die before it happens. Unless we allow our minds to be opened up and see the blessings and miracles that God does around us each and every day. And we saw that in the movie last night, over and over again, we saw instance after instance of God working through people, miracles happening around us, and people that were blind to the fact that they were there, blind to the fact that they were happening. Matthew 7, 24 through 27 says, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his 
house on the rock. The rain came down, the strings rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine is, does not put them into practice. It's like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, and the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. It fell with a great crash. So I've got a video clip from the movie last night that I'd like you to take a look at before we go on with our message so far. Prodigal son return. What's up, big bro? You got my money? I thought, trick question, baby. I went and got it myself. What about Pastor Matt? Did you touch him? Too late to know now if I did. But now, nah, he's still vertical. What's the matter with you, baby? After everything we've been through, all that I've done for you, live together, die together. And now I do want to stick on an avenue. Man, it's not like that. Then what is it? You found Jesus, and what suddenly you think you're better than all this? And I see things differently now than I saw before, and I'm trying to share that with you. Oh, don't you get it? Okay, so you try to save me. We all need to be saved. And your Jesus is going to do that. He died for us all so that we could be saved, yeah. Yeah? Well, I wouldn't die for him. Why'd you come back here? You know what I gotta do. Or what? You just thought I was gonna forgive you? I'm already forgiven. But just not by you, okay? See, you wanna forgive me so we can go back and do what we did. But Jesus forgave me so we ain't got to. And even to you, man, that's what I'm trying to tell you. We don't have to be who we were. Shut up. I can't. And I won't. He loves you, Kashan. What? Did you forget about me? So we have two professional criminals here. K. Criminal. And PB, Pretty Boy. And they're in a heated discussion in which Pretty Boy is telling Criminal that Jesus can forgive him. And just as Criminal is about to punch Pretty Boy to get him to shut up, a rival thief, Nefarious, comes into the room with a gun pointed at Criminal. And as Nefarious pulls the trigger, Pretty Boy shields Criminal with his body and takes the bullets for him. So what happened there was a transference, a, a change of roles. Transference is defined as the act of transferring something from one form to another. And another way of defining transference is the act of changing something into something different from its essential characteristics. When Jesus came into the heart of PB, a transference took place. He was given a heart for Jesus, one that cared more for others than for himself. He was lifted up out of his past and given a new life in Christ. And we need to be able to recognize the moment that Jesus called him we need to recognize the moment that Jesus calls us. John 15, 3 says that no one has greater love than this, that one should lay his life down for his friends. True love through Jesus is just like that. Now see, I could just stop here. I mean, really, what more is there to say or show than that? True love for, from Jesus is just exactly that. 
And you might think, and I don't remember Jesus ever calling me. I don't remember Jesus ever calling me, so now what? So when we go back to God's word, he's got the answer there in Romans 5.8. It says, Jesus has clearly been calling since before we knew he was calling. But God demonstrates his own love for him this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And John Gill, as I was going through some of the Bible commentaries as I was preparing the message, uh, I went through some expounded uh, Bible commentary from John Gill in here. And, and uh, so he says this about Matthew 26, 7, 26 through 30. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine, those who only externally hears them but has no understanding of them, those who not, do not believe them nor like or approve of them, but hates and despises them, or if not, only simply hears them, and in hearing them are satisfied with just a theoretical knowledge and nothing more. Does not put them into practice, does not yield the obedience of faith to the doctrines of the gospel, nor submits to the ordinances of it, but neglects them completely and all other duties of religion. Or if he does obey, it's only outwardly and not from the heart, nor from the principle of love, nor in faith, nor in the name and the strength of Christ, nor for the glory of God, but in order to obtain life for himself. Such shall be likened to that foolish man which built his house on the sand, or as Luke has it, without a foundation on the earth. So as I was going through this and I was thinking about it, that story in Matthew took on a different meaning for me. We hear the words, but yet do we respond to them? Do you believe the words? And if so, what have you done? Do we fail to put them into practice? See, Luke kind of had it there when he said it has without a foundation upon the earth. Meaning it's just sitting there on the surface of the ground without digging into it for a foundation. And such may be said about building without a foundation as those who pretend to make their peace with God by their own works. By simply coming and showing up, going through the motions. But that's a superficial, superficial belief. It just sits on the surface. Those who hope for pardon on the foot of the mercy of God and in their own repentance seek justification by their own. If you stand by yourself and not on the righteousness of Christ, you stand alone. You stand alone. They look for acceptance with God for the sake of their own worthiness. And as I've said it before, if you wait to die to throw yourself on the mercy of God, it's a little too late then. It's too late then. You can't go to God and say, God, I was great. I did all these good works while I was on earth. And he said, sorry, I never knew you. Go and serve the one you served while back on earth. See, those who expect salvation in any, any other way except by Christ, we have to think of those who built their hope of salvation on anything that is merely external, such as their riches, their grandeur, stuff of the world, their height in society, their wisdom and learning, their natural, decent, and religious education, their civility, their courteousness, and what is called good nature. Those by who their works, their morality and common justice, honesty, their legal righteousness, and their busyness of religious duties. See, if they do all those kind of things, they're just simply building their house on the sand. Showing up and doing everything that you can do and just having busyness within the church 
does not give you a foundation of faith, does not give you a foundation of belief. It has to come from the heart. You have to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You have to understand that, that Jesus is the only way to the Father in heaven. They're building their house on sinking sand, on that which will not bear weight, but gives way and sinks. In John 14, 1 through 14, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, but believe also in me. Believing in God and believing in Jesus are the same. Christ, the offer and perfecter of our faith, is the way to the Father and to heaven. Through his sacrifice, he atoned and paid for all our sin. God has therefore laid that salvation for us through his own son, Jesus. And we must be a foolish man that builds on anything short of that. And see, we do nothing when that happens. When you're asked that question, do you believe? And we do nothing. That's what happens. We're not building that foundation on Jesus. We're not building upon our faith and on our beliefs. Matthew 7, 21 and then 24 through 29 says, God first will for us to act is on receiving him as savior, and it's foolish not to act. Now, when you accept Jesus Christ as your savior, you don't get this long laundry list of things you have to do. It's really something very simple. Romans 10 gives us the answer in nine and 10. It's really acknowledging that what he offers you, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved for it is with your heart that you believe and are justified and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved embrace what jesus did for you with your whole life see that's what pb did he was just about to get a beat down from criminal he was a brand new christian yet he took that faith he took that belief that he had in his heart. He had a heart for Christ. And he put the life of criminal above his own. See, if you watch that clip of the movie and play it back and play it back, you see PB twisting and turning back against the gate as the triggers pull. And he takes the bullets. He had a foundation built on faith that he knew that Christ was his savior. Romans 12, one and two says, when we finally move beyond doing nothing, it should encompass our entire lives. Therefore, I urge you brothers and sisters in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Remember I talked about that transference that happened to him. He went from that mind of a criminal, from taking and stealing those things that did not belong to him and doing and acting against the will of God. And he transferred himself into a heart and a mind of Christ where taking the bullets was more than important and saving that man's life than it was on his own good and his own well-being and his own life. Criminal refused to act on that truth that Pretty Boy continued to offer to him. And he said, shut up. Don't talk to me about Jesus. See, and sometimes we like to live in our history, in the things that are behind us, because it's what we know. Because it seems easier instead of embracing, embracing that future that God has planned for us. Facing that great unknown. But see, the first defining moment of any of us encounters that requires us to act on what we believe is that moment that Jesus calls us out. 
And we must listen and follow where it takes us. In that moment, many choose to do nothing. But in that moment, you can choose to do something. And that's not foolish. Some of us are confronted with the question, do you believe over and over again? And maybe they even sit in church on a regular basis and they attend Sunday school or serve food at the local soup kitchen. Something behind the scenes, hidden away, safe, or so it seems. The sacrifice of Christ, much like pretty boy, buys us additional time to act on our defining moment. That moment when Christ called us. But that time does not last forever. It's finite. Unless we get out front and make a difference for someone else, we might as well sit at home and not go through the motions. We can choose to do nothing, nothing of value to God, but then we are completely separated from God because of our sin. But see, Jesus took that bullet for us so that we might have that moment to step into a relationship with God. Our decision firmly conveys what we believe and whether we're willing to back it up with action or hide it in the shadows. The choice is yours and yours alone. Choose wisely. See, faith requires action, movement, response. Otherwise, it's just knowledge. It's just knowledge. Anybody can read a book. But unless you believe it and act upon it, put it into motion, put it into movement and respond to what it says in there, you just simply drift away. We need to embrace that time for Christ first. Renew that embrace if you have slowly drifted away from a life of faith to a life that you are living on your own. It's time to embrace that back with Christ. Get back into the word. Step out in faith. Offer the message of salvation to someone desperately in need. We saw that many times last night. Jesus shares faith with them. We need to share faith as well. Offer to pray with someone, invite someone to church and to our studies. Or better yet, come to our church and our studies yourselves. And even better yet, bring them along with you when you come. So three months ago when I watched this movie, I searched and found these crosses. And they're made out of olive wood from the Holy Land. And I feel they have a very special connection to this message today and to the message we saw in the movie last night. And at the end of the service today, I've got a basket in the back. And if you haven't received one of these yet, I'd like you to take it with you. And I challenge you to put them into the hands of someone that you know that needs Jesus, that needs this message, that needs this hope, that needs this salvation. Who are struggling through, depending upon their selves to get through all of the challenges of life that have built their house on sand. Give them a new foundation. Give them a new start. Give them a new beginning. Put your faith in action. Because faith requires action, movement, and response. Otherwise, it's just knowledge. If we do nothing, is always doing something. And not responding to Christ is building that house on sand that's easily, easily crushed in a moment. And God is clearly challenging people to put their doubts aside and believe and trust in him. And in today's society, in today's world, in this nation, we need that now more than ever. And we can see it any time we turn on the news. We need God in this land more than ever. We need to trust in him. We need to follow him with abandon and act on what we believe by giving our hearts today. And see, today he might be inviting you
to do just that. And maybe you've never trusted in Jesus. Maybe all this time you have nothing to do, no defining moments or no opportunities in your lives. But I tell you today to do something. Confess that Jesus is Lord. Come to Christ. Let us pray. Lord God, hear our prayer today and heal our land. Help us to be people of faith, alive and active in doing your work and your will in our lives. Help us today to remember a life of faith is not meant to be sat idly by, but to do something. This week, help us seek out opportunities to make a difference. Help us to be the difference in the lives of someone that doesn't know you. Remind us to bring someone who needs to hear your word to our church, to our activities, to your word, to the Bible. And if they don't have a Bible, Lord, help us put one in their hands. We never know what the future will hold for us. So now is our time to do something. Lord, we ask today that you would embolden us, that we would embrace your message, and that we would become your hands and feet here and on earth as it is. So as we come to our time of communion today, it's a call for us to do something. Jesus knew that he was giving a sacrifice, a living sacrifice for us. He was giving up his life for us. It's our call to action today when we remember what Christ did for us. The act of communion is joining together, communing together with God, remembering that act of sacrifice. He's given us a second chance to go out and be his hands and feet, to go out and fulfill our purpose in life. Our purpose in life is, in case you don't know, is to serve others as God served, as Jesus served. So on the night that Jesus was given up, he took bread and he broke it. And he said, take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. And likewise, later in the meal, he filled the cup. And after he had blessed it, he said, this is the new cup of the new covenant. My blood shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. And each time that you drink of this bread and drink of this cup, do it in remembrance of me. That mighty act of love and of salvation. So as you come into this time of communion, I'd like you to, just where you are right now, just simply say a silent prayer of confession and ask Jesus to come in and do mighty acts and works in your life today. body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Thanks be to God. So we come to our time in the service right now. We have a time for prayers of people. Our opportunity to intercede for others and to share Christ's blessings and miracles and his walks among us. Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to be back this morning. And uh, I just want to share a couple miracles that we went through last weekend. And uh, my husband and I, Steve, were uh, driving to Illinois on Thursday night, and it was a beautiful night. Friday morning we get up and there's ice everywhere. And um, so we didn't get to do anything or go anywhere, but we enjoyed the weekend. 
Sunday when we come home, there's fog everywhere, but we had to drive four and a half hours in the fog to get here. And my daughter called me and um, her son, Dylan, who's 14, was flying home from Dallas from his dad's on Sunday. The plane couldn't make it to Cedar Rapids. They had to stop in Des Moines. So she had to drive clear to Des Moines to pick him up. And she was terrified, but I prayed for her and, and she did it. And then after she got Dylan, they almost were in an accident. She had to stop suddenly. Some car swerved in front of them and, and she just called me and she praised God that, you know, they were alive and everything was well and everybody was well. And, and I just thank God for these things. And, and Thursdays, you know, Mark had to drive 12 hours and sleet and snow and rain and, and he, he came here. God got us all through these. And I know they seem small, but in, in reality, it's, it's big. You know that God gets us through each and every day as we trust in him and we learn to trust in him every single day of our lives so today I know there's a lot of prayer for there's a lot of people that need prayer I have a brother and sister in law that have COVID and um, I just pray for them Lord God and I, I want to pray for Terry and wife for his shoulder he went through surgery for a sleeping disorder but his, his shoulder is now um, torn again so he'll need to go have that looked at and uh, we'll just pray for that I want to pray for Shannon she's had some problems this week and so we'll pray for her and and I just I just want to encourage everyone as we pray to just lift up the people in your lives that need prayer and uh, know that God is healing and he is in control and and I have a girlfriend Chris who had knee surgery <coughs> Thursday and she's still in the hospital she's having some some issues so I would like to ask prayer for her. So let's just close our eyes and, and just thank God for all these things. And I thank God for all these people that you've placed on our hearts today, Lord Jesus. And I just ask that the Holy Spirit come into this place, come into my mind and my heart, come into the people who are here and into the people online, just come into their lives. Fill us with the Holy Spirit so that we can feel the power of your presence in this place. I ask for divine healing for the people that I have mentioned and all those that um, are on everyone's mind, Lord Jesus. Um, just be with the, the families and friends that need healing and in some way be with all of us, Lord God, for we all need healing from one thing or another. I just ask that you be with us and comfort us. Open our minds and our hearts and, our, and um, just draw us to your word, Lord Jesus draw us each and every day and help us to know that you are God by your word. Oh, draw me, Lord. Oh, draw me, Lord. Oh, draw Sing it out loud. Oh, draw me, Lord. Oh, draw me, Lord. Oh, draw me, Lord. And I'll run after to everlasting you are always with us you are always loving us thank you jesus for who you are and who you are to us in jesus holy name amen thank you very much for that denise this brings us to the end of our online portion of our service today and we thank you for joining with us uh, we ask that if you would like to have some communion supplies sent to you, we would be more than happy to provide them for you. Uh, we do continue our service on here with some music and, and fellowship together afterwards, and we uh, thank you for joining us today.